Um, welcome. Pleased you're with us. Today, my very special guest is Dr. Sarah Pugh, um, who is extraordinary, frankly, in terms of her knowledge and uh, input into various issues. Um, today, she's talking about ketogenic and carnivore diets and how that might relate to mental health among other things, perhaps. If you don't watch South Park, you might not be familiar with Cartman, but one of his like phrases is the best way to deal with hate and prejudice is more hate and prejudice. But I feel that the medical industry seems to think the best way to deal with human biochemistry or the human condition and side effects from meds is more meds. And then we'll see how in this presentation, people can end up on three or four meds when they could have easily just done a ketogenic or a carnivore diet to get rid of their problems. So what I'm excited to share with you, I'm going to talk about inflammation and insulin resistance in the brain because it's slightly different to the body. And we're going to talk about good insulin resistance or physiological insulin resistance and then pathological insulin, insulin resistance. And then it's going to explain to you or show you why quite a lot of drugs don't work when you understand the, the theory behind brain disease or brain problems. Then we're going to look at brain fog and blood sugar because not what you think is going on. And this is really important, not just for diabetics, but for everybody, because this notion of, oh, I need to eat sugar because of my blood sugar. I might have a hypo in my brain uh, is nonsense. And then I'm going to touch a little bit on two diabetic doctors that I know. Ryan, you, you know, and then there's Dr. Ian as well, who, again, I'll have a brief little explanation of what he taught me about the brain and blood sugar. Then, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about keto and carnivore. Uh, we know they're not dangerous, but we're going to look at some psychiatric medications I think are dangerous. Then we're going to have a quick look at what the scientific literature say about car low carbon mental health, because there are always new studies coming out and it's always important to stay with your finger on the pulse with the, with the scientific literature. Then I'm going to talk to you about how I found the Atkins diet in 1999. I'm not going to go into details of this, the horrendous psychiatric problems I had in my early 20s when I was doing a PhD. But then that in some way gives me some authority to talk about psychiatric medication and the way that I was treated and how I was able to free myself from problems by discovering the Atkins diet, which is probably the most well-known low-carb diets, but uh, again, there's so many of them, I will explain all the different flavors and how I ended up where I am doing a medical ketogenic diet. Then I'm going to talk about this idea of chasing ketones and why I've played around and had ketones sometimes of three or even five millimolar. Then there's the GKI, which is the glucose ketone ratio. And I thought that the gold standard was one and I had to obtain this. And this is going to lead into things which Bart has been talking about, about why you shouldn't have high ketones all the time and some problems you can run into when you have constantly really low insulin. So remember, insulin isn't anything bad. Then I'm going to touch on the, some carnivore and keto FAQs, which get talked about a lot, like mineral imbalances, fruit, different meat choices, dairy, breaking keto and things like that. And also, if you follow what's going on on the tube, you might have noticed that the vegans are now getting upset about uric acid because meat and liver raise it. Well, no shit, but so does fru fructose massively, losing weight, heavy exercise, fasting and ketones and salt. So we're going to touch on that because it's a really important and misunderstood topic, a bit like cholesterol. Right, so we'll get started. And as you probably know, um, blood sugar in the body is really well regulated because glucose is toxic to the insides of the cells. and the body's got lots of mechanisms to deal with um, too much glucose, like turning it into fat, storing it as glycogen, uh, locking it out of cells in the Randall cycle, which we'll come to later if you're not familiar with that, or we can even pee it out. And in the body, the blood vessels and the red blood cells are tougher than everybody else. So unfortunately, they have to take the brunt of too much glucose. And in reality, there's only about one teaspoon of um, sugar in in your blood. So the amount of sugar that we actually need isn't this vast quantity that some people imagine it is. And then here I've got um, a little quick diagram talking about AGEs, which end um, advanced glycosylation end products. So this is the consequence of having 
your cells and brain and things soaked in glucose that non-enzymatic glycosylation will happen and there's a whole host of problems that this will lead to so i'm not going to talk about any of these problems you can see here which are uh, fertility problems both male and female diabetes atherosclerosis i'm going to focus on mental health and just to reiterate again about gluconeogenesis, about how we're extremely well equipped to make all of the glucose that we need ourselves. And I'm just going to continuously remind people of this because it's so easy to get sidetracked on the internet about people telling you otherwise. So the way that the setup is in the brain, um, glucose can always get into the brain. It's like an open door and we have the blood brain barrier that people are familiar with to stop nasty things getting in and things we need in the brain getting out. And the brain, brain blood sugar is always 60% of the peripheral blood sugar. So just for an example, say if your blood sugar was 100 milligrams per deciliter or 5.5 millimolar, your brain blood sugar is gonna be 60 and then, um, or 3.3. Or and as your blood sugar changes, so does your brain sugar. So if you've got high blood sugar in the periphery, it's going to match, it's gonna match that in the brain, but the brain sugar is always 60% less of the blood sugar. And when we talk about insulin resistance in the brain, the problem actually occurs at the blood brain barrier. That's the place where insulin resistance um, occurs. And where I'm talking about fasting insulin of over um, eight, resulting from chronically high blood sugar over a long period of time. So this would be the bad kind of insulin resistance resulting from, quite simply put, just overconsumption of carbohydrates and, and stress as well. So just to make a note that the insulin resistance is at the blood brain barrier. So what, what this means is that when we've got insulin resistance at the blood brain barrier, the insulin can't get into the brain and the cells in the brain need insulin to use glucose properly. And there's a hell of a lot of insulin receptors in things like the hippocampus, which is for memory, the prefrontal cortex for sort of cognitive control. It's like the executive center of the brain where your personality lives, all of your sort of uh, uh, executive functions, logic, basically the frontal lobe. And then we've got the amygdala, which is the emotional side of the brain. And as you can imagine, we want these three areas functioning well, and lots of emotional problems can result from amygdalas being not working properly. For example, PTSD is one of them. Then just to start to um, come into it with the research, we already know that um, insulin resistance and blood brain dysfunction is one of the underlying problems in bipolar disorder. So again, just to reiterate, it's the glucose can get into the brain whenever it wants, and it will just do that, but the insulin can't when there's insulin resistance, it kind of gets locked out. So it is a slightly different mechanism to other kinds uh, of, of, the, of um, systems in the body. Right, so what we've now got this situation is, so imagine we've got an insulin resistant brain. We've constantly got this brain swimming in glucose because it can just come in whenever it wants. And as I mentioned earlier in the slide, we have this problem where the glucose can start to attach itself to cells and basically stop them working properly. I'm not gonna go massively into detail, but when you've got sugar or glycosylated cells, it's extremely damaging. And that would then lead to not just brain fog, which would be the early stages, There's, it can lead to Alzheimer's, depression, and also once again, bipolar and schizophrenia. There's a big link with um, insulin resistance and type two diabetes in um, things like schizophrenia and bipolar. So again, there's references to this. It's not something new. It, it, people have known about this for a long time, but it does tend to get stuffed under the carpet, especially when it comes to depression, bipolar and schizophrenia. And you'll see why when I get into the psychiatric meds. Now, again, the brain's dual fuel and it's not, it can't run just on, on ketone bodies because there are certain neurons that need glucose and there are certain other cells in the body that need glucose too. So, but on the converse side of that, you don't want to be running your brain or you don't need to run it on 100% glucose either. And about 75% of the brain's energy needs can be supplied by ketones. But as I've said before, any extra glucose that it needs can easily be made um, 
it, it's it, it, itself in the liver. So, so this is an example of like one of my readings because I'm always measuring and reading things on myself just for, to collect data. So I've had a, that's an example of a GKI of one. So my ketones are 3.7 and my glucose is 3.7. And I didn't keel over of a, of a hypo. I didn't even know what my blood sugar was when I measured it. So it's back to this thing that you don't need to have a huge blood sugar rushes in your brain for it to function. It's perfectly happy functioning on a, a low threshold as long as you can make up the deficit with, with ketones and they don't need to be this high either. We'll, we'll talk about that later. It's just to show people data and give examples. Now, you might be familiar with Dr. Ryan Attar. He's a, um, a type 1 diabetic doctor who's got phenomenally good um, blood sugar control because there's this terrible problem that diabetics, especially in the UK, are told and, and everywhere, oh, just eat carbs and just deal with your blood sugar. And when, when they have terrible fluctuating blood sugar, they get told off by the nurse, oh, just control your blood sugar better. And how are they supposed to do that? Uh, and Ryan's been on Bart's channel a lot, a, a lot, and um, he's talked about his HbA1Cs and how it's he regulates it super tightly. Ryan, I think now is 100% carnivore. I have watched some of his TikToks and um, follow, found him talking about uh, his his diet. Uh, for people in the UK, uh, there's Dr. Ian Lake, who is a type one diabetic, and I met him at a Keto Live conference, and he discovered um, a low carb diet and it changed his life. And he has uh, a website, he teaches other doctors, he teaches practitioners how to do ketogenic diets with type one diabetics. Because again, Ian just couldn't emphasize enough how terrible these hypers are because type ones are just told, oh, run your blood sugar really high, even things like nine, just to say safe in case you have a hypo. Well, Ian said he's only ever had about one hypo and he was just constantly in these hypers, this high blood sugar. So he had brain fog, um, he had more prone to infections because nobody told him that, you know, it was ridiculous running the blood sugar this high. Nobody told him he could be keto. So we'll move on from there because those these two men will have plenty they'll probably want to come well Ian will probably want to come and talk to Bart on his channel I'll do an introduction and then if we dive back into one class of medication so uh, there haven't been any successes for Alzheimer's drugs for a long time they keep failing so from 2010 to 2015 there was just a succession of failures um, there aren't any new ones as far as I know in the pipeline so we basically might as well look at your diet for your brain because unfortunately there's no anti-Alzheimer's or dementia drugs coming in the near future. Despite what the drug companies like to tell you, they've had a string of disastrous results. And even ones that get licensed often get taken off again because they don't work properly or they've got side effects. And again, um, for people that say, oh, the ketogenic diet's dangerous, there isn't any studies. Well, actually there's plenty of studies on using ketogenic diets and even just MCT oils to relieve some of the conditions of Alzheimer's because again, all the drugs are failing. Something else which is really important is talking about depression because it's really rife and uh, I'm fully aware that all different things can cause depression. We're going to focus on the biology today. And again, there are plenty of studies pointing at the evidence for inflammation in the brain being associated with depression, including inflammation in young children and adolescents, which is obviously a serious problem because it just terrifies me, the idea of young people being on very strong psychiatric medication when there could be an alternative. And again, it's nothing new. It's not something that I've invented. There's, these studies have been around for a long time. And just so that people don't think I'm being unsympathetic about mental health, uh, I'm fully aware that work, stress, toxic people, messed up body clocks, money, diet, lack of physical activity, trauma, bad sleep, all contribute to mental health problems. Sometimes we can't do anything about money or horrible other people, but we can control our diets, our body clocks and our sleep. Uh, and I am fully aware that other things do contribute to it, but today we're just going to focus on the biochemistry. 
So just to summarize where we're at, if you can fix your inflammation, your insulin resistance, food sensitivities, oxidative stress, and nutrient deficiencies, you've got a really good chance of getting relief from depression, anxiety, mood swings, weight issues, and a lot more. So I haven't got time to talk about food sensitivities and nutrient deficiencies today, because that needs a whole other webinar. We're just going to concentrate on mainly inflammation, oxidative stress, and insulin resistance. So wh why, do, why do I care so much about the mental health? Well, firstly, like when you've had problems and you found something really simple like a diet to, to fix it, you get very evangelical about it. And also 800,000 people die every year from suicide. And a large proportion of that is going to be people with mental health and particularly things like bipolar and other forms of mental health problems. And I think that's quite a frightening number. And again, some of these people could have been saved. We've got this explosion in psychiatric medicine use, and I just don't think they're things to be popping willy nilly. When you, when I get into what they actually do and how they work, you'll be like, hmm, that's not something you should be dishing out by the bucket load. And we've got this terrible problem of food misuse and food misinformation. And food is one of the most powerful drugs that we encounter on a daily basis. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. So we're going to go back into looking at, well, even just something simple like mixing macronutrients or excluding carbohydrates, just something like that can make a massive difference. And when it comes to the data about this, these antidepressants, 2021 data from UK said that 20 million antidepressant uh, drugs were prescribed. In 2013, one in six Americans use psychiatric medication. Now, latest data says it's one in five. I pulled up this graph from uh, New Zealand because from 2010 to 2020, we've got like a 25% increase in the use of antipsychotics and antidepressants. So antipsychotics have all of a sudden started to get popular because they're being used for things like anxiety and sleeping problems. And when you see what they actually do, they're not designed for that. We really can't be doing this to people, giving them these medications, doing this repurposing constantly when there are other ways to manage this problem. So it's a very real problem. And this leads into these food mythologies. So I could write food mythology one to 100. And the most important one is there is no scientific evidence that animal foods are dangerous to human health, period. And again, just so that people can have the data for themselves, this is the nitrogen isotopes paper about what our ancestral diet was. And you can go and look for yourself and see that people have been eating predominantly animal products for the past three million years. And we also have lots of science to show that animal foods are vital for our mental health. For example, where would we get choline from? Where would we get heme iron from? Where would we get omega-3 from? Where would we get carnitine from? What about creatine? What about vitamin B12? Again, vitamin B12 supplements were only invented in the 1950s. So again, we have plenty of evidence showing that animal foods contain these vital nutrients and plants don't. I've got nothing against plants. They just don't contain those things as much as you want to uh, dispute this. And then what gets neglected here is this inflammation problem from overeating fats and carbs together. And again, in this mythology about people getting really upset and jumping up and down, arguing about whether chicken's dangerous or, you know, should we be eating like red meat once a week? Once again, they completely ignore the fact of all these dangerous medications that are being given to children. Right. So I'm going to just go and dive into the Randall cycle, but talk about it in a kind of less scientific way because it can alarm people that are not scientists. So there's a particular breed of hummingbird. It's like a red throated hummingbird and it normally feeds on nectar every 10 to 15 minutes. And, and nectar is made of, well, it's, up, it's up to like half of its sucrose. So it's basically liquid sugar and we've got glucose and fructose in there. And the, these hummingbirds need to migrate for about 500 miles every year and they don't have any food or water on this journey. And the hummingbird only weighs about three to three and a half grams, but what happens is it, it doubles in weight ready for its flight so it can get to this size and it does it really quickly as well so it, these hummingbirds can gain 0.15 grams of fat per gram of body weight per day 
and it just goes everywhere in the bird. And to compare to humans, that's like one of us gaining 10 kilos of fat a day. And then the hummingbirds switch into ketosis very quickly. So when they do their giant flight, they don't lose any protein or, or muscle mass or, on the flight. And the, the hummingbirds also use their own fat like a camel uh, or when people do dry fasting to make their own water when they do this flight. And, and the fat that when you burn your own fat and make your own water, you make deuterium free water. So like the best quality water. But I'm going to come back to the deuterium water at the end of the talk. So, so basically, we've got this scenario. How did that hummingbird double in weight so quickly? What, what, what's it done? So. What it's done is it started to eat uh, more insects up to a thousand a day. And I had loads of slides on insects and, eat, and, and what they taste like and, uh, and eating them. But the take home message for today is in insects contain or can contain up to 50% fat. So some insects are more fatty than a chocolate bar. And then in certain places, people put fat balls and nuts and seeds out for the birds. So what's happening now is they're gobbling up their nectar, which I said to you earlier was sucrose so sugar and then now they're eating a load of insects and fat balls so for people that are familiar with the randall cycle what's happening here is the hummingbirds are eating lots of fats and carbs and fructose together to double in size and gain fat so even though we talk about the randall cycle in terms of human beings it's there for other reasons and animals and even hummingbirds do this as well they deliberately eat a lot of mixed macronutrients including things that contain fructose to basically blow out their appetites and just gain this huge amount of weight really quickly. And for people, um, the scientists, the food scientists, of course, know all about this and they love mixing fats and carbs together because they want us to overeat and get addicted to their food to buy more. But I just want to say it's this natural phenomenon that goes on in the animal kingdom and it's not something that people make up because we're anti-carb or anything like that. It's a very real biological situation. So that was an example of the hummingbirds. Right, so Mr. Well, Sir um, Randall, he was also, he was an MD and he was a diabetes and mitochondrial researcher. And in 1963, he started talking about fatty acids rule and carbs subserve. During that time, sort of in the early 60s, late 50s, when Randall was doing his research, there was another character around, a Ansel Keys. And again, he needs a whole other webinar to himself. But Ansel Keys is the person which initiated all of this nonsense about cholesterol and saturated fat being harmful because he basically did a study uh, on lots of countries and he left out the countries which he didn't like the data of. So if in doubt, leave it out, even if it's a whole country, would Ansel Keys say. So it's just to give you a picture of when people were talking about the Randall cycle and it's nothing new. It's been known about for a very, very long time. And let's look and see what this Randall cycle is. So before we dive in, for people that are not um, kind of biochemists, we, we've got these ratios of ATP to ADP and phosphate. So this is really important, this ratio, because obviously we want lots of ATP and we don't want lots and lots of phosphate kicking around in the cell unnecessarily because that can set off inflammation. And that is going to be a theme for the rest of this talk. So remember that. And then we have these ratios of NADH to NAD, NAD. DPH to NAD, acetyl-CoA to CoA. And the higher the rate, these ratios, the better, so the higher the redox potential in the cell. So we want high ratios of these. And if, if you're kind of lost already, just think, okay, I just want lots of ATP to get made and I don't want lots of phosphate. That's the most important one for today. And then uh, coenzyme A, because we talk about acetyl-CoA a lot and some people have no idea what it is. It's like a really important molecule, but just so you know, coenzyme A is a great big massive thing. So coenzyme, acetyl-CoA can't just wander around anywhere in, in the cell and the body. It has to be confined to certain areas. It's just too big to, to, to get in and out. So what I've done here is I've drawn out the Randall cycle 
uh, in a different sort of slightly more friendly way to explain to people because it's very frightening looking at biochemistry diagrams if you're not a biochemist so, so we're just going to take our attention to the top row and we've got these different doors in the cells so we've got the cd36 where the fatty acids can go in then we've got a glut 4 transporter and the glut 4 transporter can get locked closed because some glucose transporters are open all the time and the glucose can just go in whenever it feels like it We've also got an MCT2 transporter because, again, ketones can get into the cell. We're not going to talk about ketones just now, but it is the kind of thing people who are more advanced are going to think, well, we talk about the Randall cycle and glucose and nobody ever asks about ketones and glucose in the cell together. So when it comes to the purple and the green doors, they're a bit less sort of strict. It's like the back door in a nightclub. They do get shut, but... The CD36 in particular is called a promiscuous transporter, so it's open a bit more than usual and other things can go in it because the cell doesn't really get too upset if there's a, a, like an amount of fat in the cell, but it gets really upset if there's too much glucose. So it's got it's going to lock the glucose out as soon as it, it needs to or it can. So in this scenario here, we've got plenty of fat in the bloodstream and hardly any glucose. So what happens here is the, the fatty acids go into the mitochondria and then they get used and they make some acetyl-CoA and that builds up and then we build up citrate. So the acetyl-CoA has to stay in, in there. It can't get out anywhere, but the citrate can come out. And then what it does now is it blocks the pathway of glucose getting in the cell. So it locks the cell and the glucose is locked out. So for people who are just listening and not really looking at the pictures, we've got a situation now where we've locked the glucose out of the cell because we just want to use the fats. And also it stops the glucose getting metabolized into pyruvate as well. So now we've got a scenario where the cell would just be running on fat. So this would be like a carnivore diet or a um, ketogenic diet. And then again, we're not going to go massively into the um, ketones, but they can get in as well. And they there's a whole regulation system to do with those two. Right, so what's the clinical relevance of this? Well, it, it's because, as you can imagine, and I've just said, the cell isn't too bothered if, if there's fat coming in. It's not, gonna, it's not gonna damage it as long as it's not in massive excess. So here people will say, oh, look, well, th there we go. There's some cells full of fat and now it's locked glucose out of the cell. So it's a caused insulin resistance. Well, that's just, as I just said, it's, it's, being, it's being resistant to insulin. It's locked its glute four door because it's full of fat. It doesn't want any glucose because it's got enough energy already. So then you can get scenarios where doctors get shouted at because they're using ketogenic or carnivore diets to um, treat their patients. And some people will say, oh, but yes, you're making them insulin resistant. It's like, no, I am treating people in a correct way. And the cells are doing what they're supposed to do by locking the glucose out because they don't need it because the people are now running on fat as a fuel and again lots of people will say well i did this to my patients and they got high ketones and they got better i'm going to quickly go through it the other way so this is another scenario say if we don't have very much fat in the bloodstream we've got lots of glucose so obviously um we want to make sure that we don't overload cells with with with, with too much energy they don't like it so in this situation here the cell is going to once again, build up citrate, it goes out, but this time there's a slightly different pathway. So it gets made into acetyl-CoA out of the citrate, then into malonyl-CoA. And now malonyl-CoA locks the door on the mitochondria so that the fatty acids can't get in. And then it can also trigger making triglycerides or new fat out of this extra glucose so it can go out and then the problem is dealt with. So now the cell is running purely on, well, it, it's never one, it's never a binary, it's always a sliding scale, but predominantly running on glucose. So this would be a, a diet which is high in carbohydrates and very low in fat. And there are several kinds, for example, the ray peat, which we won't talk about in detail, maybe at the end, and then some plant-based diets can be high in carbs. But like I said earlier, as we can make our own carbohydrates, why do we need to eat them? 
And then here I've just drawn it out so it does it all itself. So what happens here, this is now when we've got lots of fat and lots of sugar all together, all trying to get into the cells. The cell's going to completely freak out now because it, you're trying to stuff too much energy into it and it's full. It doesn't want it. So it's going to lock out the fat and the, uh, push the fat out, lock it out, lock out the, the glucose. And if you take your attention now to what's happened to the ATP and ADP ratio, that's gone down. The, the NADH to NAD ratios have gone down. So we've basically got a mitochondria that's not functioning properly either because we've created this situation. We're trying to stuff mixed macronutrients in and the cell will do absolutely everything to, to protect itself. Also, the, the um, phosphate, the PI, which it's called here, is a trigger to set off uh, the inflammatory cascade. So now we've not just got a mitochondria that's not making ATP properly, we've got one of the first steps in systemic inflammation. As we were talking about mental health today, we already have learned that depression has a huge uh, element of um, inflammation associated with it. And then things like bipolar, we already know the insulin resistance and sugar and lack of ketones is a problem as well. So again, if you've got a mental health situation, this going on in your mitochondria is just going to make it worse. And activating the Randall cycle, which is overeating fats and carbs will lead to overeating um, like the hummingbirds did. So people can develop sort of weight problems over time and we've got insulin resistance of the bad variety and then as i said we've got the risk to our brains not just from having too much glucose swimming around in it but also because we've set off this inflammatory cascade and the brain really doesn't like inflammation well neither do any cell in the body but again today is about mental health so here you can see how choosing a diet that is free of or limited in carbs can help you with your insulin resistance, your inflammation, and your oxidative stress. So you've already got some, some tools now for relief from depression, anxiety, mood swings, pain, and weight issues and more. So that's again reiterating how the Randall cycle, mixing macronutrients and just stopping doing that alone massively helps people. You don't need to sometimes go full carnivore or even do a ketogenic diet properly. So this is now talking about Dr. Atkins. So he he's a very clever man. He's passed away now and he didn't die of a heart attack. He fell and got concussion and died from that. And it was nothing to do with anything that he ate. And he says food compulsion isn't a character disorder, character disorder it's a chemical disorder. So again, that's some people aren't overeating because they're greedy. They're just mixing the wrong nutrients in their bodies and upsetting their leptin, their hormones, and it's triggering this overeating. And again, in medical school, I'm sure doctors are still saying, you know, uh, we need to do this balanced diet, uh, not these silly fads like keto or meat only. And Dr. Atkins's uh, book, this I think this one here that I've uh, mentioned, he I think got first time got published in 1971. So again, he's been around a long time. So just quickly about me, I'm not going to um, go into detail because I told you at the beginning, but again, it was. Uh, Dr. Atkins' book that I found that really helped me because of problems of using psychiatric medication and the weight gain and they weren't working and I didn't know anything about mental health uh, then uh, and I did the Atkins diet and I just thought I just got better by myself and I'd had one incident and it was better. I'd never, I didn't know for the next like 15 years um, about ketones and mental health. So during that time, I've had plenty of time to experiment with different ways of eating, uh, nootropic supplements and mental health. And again, like I iterated, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm a biochemist, but being a biochemist means I can go into PubMed whenever I want and look shit up. and find out things, learn about different drugs, analyze data for myself. When it comes to food changes, I am a hypnotist as well. And I do think a lot of people would love to change their way of eating. They just psychologically can't. So again, I fully appreciate that it's not easy. It, it might be easy for me because I've got no choice about it. And I've done it for the last 20 years. And 20 years ago, there wasn't all this keto crap around and it was just easy just to eat not eat carbs even though people laughed at me and i was some thought i was some kind of weirdo so um there we go so back to the bipolar problem so basically um 
I didn't even know this till I made this talk. There's 46 million people who've got bipolar disorder and bipolar is treated with a lot of the same anticonvulsant drugs that are used for epilepsy. Now, people that do know about the ketogenic diet, they'll know that it was invented about 100 years ago and used to treat epilepsy. But there've been all sorts of flavors of low carb diets throughout the centuries. They just have never been named. So people have been, and other doctors have used low carb as well. I think, um, the scientist that invented the craft assay, the best test for diabetes, he was really into uh, low carbon keto as well, but there's many more. There's a really high rate of suicide uh, with bipolar and sometimes these heavy duty medications don't work. There's lots of different theories about bipolar because too much uh, sodium in the brain can cause problems for epileptics and by people with bipolar. But again, there's lots of pointing at insulin resistance and also studies saying that mitochondrial disruption in bipolar along with insulin resistance causes this glucose metabolism crisis in the brain. Again, the drug companies know this anyway, and there are lots and lots of papers saying if you treat people with, with bipolar with metformin, then you get improvements in their, in their uh, symptoms. Well, no shit, of course you are, if bipolar is linked to insulin resistance and blood sugar problems. But the problem is metformin comes with a huge list of, of side effects like vitamin B12 depletion. Um, it can cause muscle problems during exercise. You don't get any benefits of the exercise. And I think there's a new study out about um, metformin and birth defects. But again, it's not treating, treating the root cause of the problem. It's just trying to fight fire with fire. So then the question is, what would happen if we could provide an alternative fuel source for bipolar without more meds? So this comes into another person or people I met at Keto Live. So this is um, Jan um, Bazuki and her husband is the CEO of Roblox, which you may or may not have heard about, like massive um, virtual reality. And you have to look it up yourself. It's massive. And they have the Bazuki Brain Research Fund, which funds scientists and likewise, especially to do with bipolar, because um, one of their children um, has terrible, had terrible bipolar until he discovered the ketogenic diet and he, he was able to get massive relief. So they fund research in this area because they also think, well, we need to find what's the root cause of this. Are there natural ways to treat bipolar? And then here in the UK, I've met Dr. Ian Campbell and he was at the conference and he's doing a eight week ketogenic diet study in University of Edinburgh. And he himself, he had terrible bipolar and nothing worked, including the medication. And he put, put his bipolar into remission with a ketogenic diet. I was chatting to Ian the other day and Ian's going to try carnivore because again, as you're starting to notice, lots of these studies are all on the ketogenic diet, but we haven't got any studies yet on carnivore. So we don't know for certain, is it the ketones or is it the elimination of carbs and removal of the inflammatory agents? But it's a really good start. So that study will be interesting to see. So there we go. That's um, Ian. And Ian has a podcast which is called Keto Bipolar. I'm going on it next Monday. But again, for, for anybody listening who does have bipolar or know somebody that does, reaching out to Ian and the bazookies, it would be a really good thing for you to do. Then also at the conference, I met Dr. Georgia Ede. I have done her training course, which was on ketogenic diets and psychiatric situations and medications. And if you don't know Dr. Ede, she's got lots of really good talks online. She's a brilliant speaker. If you like Paul Mason, you'll like Georgia Ede because it's the similar thinking. She's very intelligent. She's got lots of talks called pl on planty nutrients, debunking the anti-meat dogma nonsense with science. And she's extremely good to listen to, like uh, Paul Mason is, lots of things about lectins, ox, all sorts of stuff, but very well worth a listen. And her website's Diagnosis Diet. She was involved in a study in with another psychiatrist in France where they looked at ketogenic diets uh, with people with serious mental health problems like schizophrenia, bipolar, major depression. And they had a really good outcome in this. I can't remember how long the study was, but 100% of the patients had improvements in the symptoms. Nearly all of them lost weight. Some were discharged, well, 64% were discharged on less medication, which is always a good thing. And then 43% got clinical remission, which means for the time being, the symptoms all went away. And as far as I know, they didn't take any medication. So that's really important because even though it's only 
a small study and it's not a randomized control. It's not anything fancy yet. It's still a start. Right, so when we look behind the keto curtain, because I've mentioned these different ketogenic diets, so people who've been into this for a long time, th there's probably 30 or maybe even 50 types of fasting, which again could technically produce ketones. We've got the cyclical ketogenic diets coming on and off. We've got things like low carb, which is five, 50 to 100 grams of carbs a day, and that can work really well for some people and, and for diabetics. We've got the traditional Atkins diet, which is a four-step process. I won't go into that. We've got Ketovore, which I know Dr. Ken Berry and his wife, um, his wife uses the Ketovore because it reversed her Hashimoto's. And then we've got the zero carb, the animal-based, the, the, the carnivore, which isn't so ketone focused. And I'll explain why later. So when we get into these ketogenic diets, some people get really confused now because we start talking about these percentages and these ratios. So like the, the four to one and the three to one, they're the sort of diets for very serious things like epilepsy, cancer, stuff like that. Then we've got the less, well, not extreme, just a lower ratio. I'll, I'll show you a bit more detail on the next slide. And then we've even got um, MCT oil ketos where you take out a big chunk of fat and put sometimes 15 grams of MCT oil in. This is a lot for the neurodegeneration like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So there are lots of people that use these kind of medical ketogenic diets that are quite structured, well, very structured to help people. So we've got what the general public do, and then we've got what practitioners do. And like I've said lots of times, you know, which one's the best for you? Well, well how do I know? I've got no idea. So when I work with people, it could be any one of these that, that, that I want to use and you can move in between them. And I've tried out, we'll have to try them out to, to make sure I actually know how to build one of these diets. But again, there is no right or wrong. You don't have to be, you can't have, don't have to be just carnivore 100%. You might want to eat a certain kind of plant because you have to. And I'll come into that later of what I do when I'm not carnivore, what things do I eat that I've found to be least offensive. So again, did my medical ketogenic diets training with um, Beth and Denise and, and Beth's been um, making ketogenic diets for the last 30 years and has gone around the world talking about them. And she works with children with epilepsy, people with Prada Willy, like the really serious stuff that I'd be much too frightened to work with. And Beth's completely normal and probably one of the most lovely people I've met, but her knowledge is phenomenal. And then Denise has been doing ketogenic uh, diets for the last 15 years. And she's written a book about uh, ketones and migraines. That's her, like she loves loves that. So there's plenty of research on using ketogenic diets for managing migraines. I don't know about carnivore. There's probably lots of anecdotal evidence. People can talk about that in the comments. So again, when I did my training, it, was, it wasn't just something I was making shit up. I actually did it with people who know what they're doing. So when we talk about these these um, ketogenic diets, the four to one, as you can see in this picture here, we've got four fats to one carbon protein. And then the three to one would be three fats to one carbon protein. And, and, and as you can imagine, that would be pretty hard to do. You, you, it's gonna be restrictive. It, it's the amount of fats you're gonna have to eat a lot. But again, like I, I said earlier, it's for making lots of ketones for serious conditions. When we get down to the two to ones and the one to ones, and then where the carnivore would, would be, this is where we start to get sort of lower ratios. So for example, the one to one fats to protein would be like half and half, like a hundred grams of fat and a hundred grams of protein. And then quite a common ratio for carnivore. And if I do carnivore, I've learned to have to do it this way would be um, 60 fat and 40 protein because you can run it or some people can run into problems with these higher fat ratios. Some people don't. I don't really, but other people can do. But like I just said earlier, you don't have to do a really strict keto all the time. You might want to just do it for three weeks just to see what it feels like. You're not tied to it forever unless you're an epileptic or you've got cancer or you've got a serious um, neurodegenerative condition you want to halt. And again, somebody else who people might or might not know about is Dr. Ken Berry. And he has a really good book, Lies My Doctor Told. And Ken Berry is a big fan of, of Bart as well. And he's mentioned Bart on his channel. 
Dr. Berry sometimes talks about a two to one carnivore. And as I've said before, what he means is it's two grams of fat to one gram of protein plus carbs. So uh, this is, again, a, a more keto uh, generative carnivore. Would, I've done this one and I would stick to I generally stick to this ratio. But he doesn't say you have to do this. He just mentions it on his channel for people who are wondering, well, what, what do these ratios mean? But that's because, as I mentioned earlier, his wife is a ketovore and she was trying to put her Hashimoto's in remission. And the ketovores tend to be carnivore diets or people who are pursuing the higher ketones. So again, Dr. Berry, a great listen, and the book's excellent as well if you're interested in um, complete bullshit that, that the medical profession tries to hoodwink people with. So as you can see, it looks a bit complicated to make these um, ketogenic and carnivore diets and how, how horrible I have to give up my carbs, my, my sugar, my cakes and everything. So it wouldn't popping a pill be easier. And considering there are 140 medicines available to treat mental illness, we're not short of, of choice. So let's have a little look at some of them so we um, can see are they these wondrous things that, that when Prozac was marketed, we were led to believe. Right, so the number one SSRI antidepressant prescribed at the moment in the UK is sertraline or Zoloft, and it's prescribed along with something called citalopram. Citalopram is falling out of favour because my GP told me the other day that citalopram um, causes, she's worried about people's hearts, so she doesn't prescribe it anymore because she just uses sertraline. And sertraline is only a very weak SSRI anyway, so... Um, and sertraline is used for depression, OCD, social anxiety, panic disorder, PTSD, binge eating, general anxiety, and premenstrual dis, uh, problems. The premenstrual problems are really interesting because SSRIs, especially sertraline, is re are really good at converting progesterone into allopregnolone. Well, they don't convert it, they assist the enzyme which does the conversion. And nobody really talks about allopregnenolone unless you're in the field of really bad hormonal problems. So allopregnenolone is like our own natural barbiturate. It's really good for suppressing anxiety, psychotic episodes, everything. So that's one of the ways which sertraline and other SSRIs work. It's nothing to do with serotonin, just got discovered by accident. So I'm not anti any of these medications, but if you do suffer from terrible PMT, you can just take sertraline for three or four days while you've got terrible PMT, because for some people, that's the only thing that's going to sort it out and it ruins their lives. You don't have to take it for any other time. The other thing I find that I laugh about with, with sertraline is it's touted as having a short half-life of 24 hours. Well, that means after 24 hours, there's half the amount of sertraline in your body. So if you've been on sertraline for 10 years, imagine how much of it's built up inside you over time. And sertraline doesn't just talk to progesterone, it um, does things to do with prolactin levels, thyroid hormones, it inhibits um, certain calcium channels in human, uh, for, in human sperm, it does, it interacts all over the place. But again, it's nothing nasty. Uh, well, it's, it, it is, but it, it's useful, but it was, it's been marketed for things that it doesn't that it doesn't even do and that's why 100 people have sued Pfizer claiming that sertraline is dangerous to unborn children and it didn't work to treat depression well that's actually true because it's not even a proper SSRI so again luckily for the pharmaceutical companies sertraline happened to do lots of other things so they were able to repurpose it so that's law lawsuit number one then we've got paroxetine or serox it's called seroxat or serox fat because it's um, meant for depression, OCD, panic disorder, anxiety, but it's absolutely terrible for, for weight gain. Um, and you'll see why in a moment, because it's also was discovered to treat menopause symptoms because it interacts with estrogen receptors. Well, if I was a man, I wouldn't be really comfortable with this. And the men that I've worked with and know who've used paroxetine not only got uh, overweight, they also got quite sweaty as well. So again, I'm just, a bit concerned about these medications that are meant for one thing and turn out to do 25 things 
And again, paroxetine interacts with delta opioid receptors. It actually interacts with a, a particular pathway to do with inflammation. So it might be being repurposed for osteoarthritis. And then, as I mentioned before, other SSRIs have this estrogenic activity as well. So if I had breast cancer or anything like that, I'd be a bit concerned about these medications because I would just assume they were doing something with serotonin. And then again, we've got plenty of lawsuits for paroxetine because of birth defects, withdrawal symptoms and suicide. So we've got 5,000 this time against GSK. Then a paper came out really recently this year, and it's all about, it was a massive study of all of the current research on serotonin and this theory about um, serotonin and, and happy chemicals and depression. And what it's what it concluded was there's no support for the hypothesis that depression is caused by low serotonin. So it was only a hypothesis right from the start. I won't go into the details about how in this hospital to do with patients with tuberculosis, they got this idea that serotonin might be a happy chemical. And this paper is not to be sniffed at because it's 17 studies or the study of 17 studies, and some of them are systematic reviews. We've got collaborative meta-analysis, so it's strong science. So uh, this, th this thing about these SSRIs and, and serotonin depression, the scientists and people have known for decades it's been nonsense, but nobody's actually pinned them down properly. And then, as people may know, Prozac was the very first one that everyone got excited about. But Eli Lilly has had to pay out 50 million in lawsuits against Prozac. So back to what I was talking about at the beginning about diets being dangerous and then meds being dangerous. Already, we're kind of seeing, well, this is a bit of a problem because antidepressants nowadays are just viewed as this thing you can just dish out and anybody can just pretty much go in and get a prescription. Then we've got all the side effects. So we've got dependence, suicide, weight gain and insulin resistance, sexual dysfunction, not being able to orgasm. And if you type in PubMed about SSRIs and side effects, there's 18,000 results. So you can knock yourself out for all of the different um, side effects. And interestingly, the, there is one SSRI that's used for premature ejaculation. Uh, that was, I can't remember its name. So it's a no brainer that the stronger ones are going to cause people not be able to have orgasm or sex at all. So again, it just affects people's um, quality of life. So, so the bottom line is anybody actually even know what SSRIs do? How much is placebo? And if it is, are the side effects worth it? And again, changing your diet not only helps your mental health, but when it comes to balancing your own hormones and getting sort of horny again that can be a massive game changer for people and when these medications do the opposite so now we've got another class of medication which are antipsychotics so 20 years ago when i had to use them like nobody talked about it and it was a massive taboo and it was all very shameful and embarrassing but now uh, olanzapine i've seen it being prescribed for um for teenagers who've got anxiety or people who have got sleep problems and it's a dopamine receptor antagonist. So basically it just blocks up your dopamine receptors and it doesn't mind where the dopamine receptors are. It'll just do any of them. So in high doses, you can get Parkinsonian like symptoms and akathisia and horrible things like that. Because of the situation about the serotonin nonsense, now the dopamine hypothesis in psychosis is being questioned. And antipsychotics are absolutely dreadful for weight gain, insulin resistance and obesity. So they're doing something else, not that's nothing to do with dopamine receptors like the SSRIs are talking to all kinds of molecules in the body and as you'll know for yourselves insulin resistance is a terrible risk for cardiovascular disease and there are poor people who are going to be on these meds forever like I said I don't really like this idea of them being given to teenagers for anxiety and also talking again about good insulin resistance or physiological insulin resistance when people are pregnant or a teenager and you need to grow you're naturally going to be insulin resistant but do we want to add these kind of drugs in on top and give some poor teenager uh, a weight problem for the rest of their lives and there's hundreds of studies again on olanzapine causing diabetes, olanzapine inducing insulin resistance, uh, olanzapine and weight problems, or, you know, you can, it's not something that's hidden under the carpet. So since 1998, this puzzle of, well, why does olanzapine make people go, gain weight? Well, well, first of all, it reduces adiponectin, which is important for body weight 
regulation increases the number of ghrelin receptors, apparently, which means people are going to be more hungry because there's empty receptors screaming for, for ghrelin. And it also disturbs testosterone levels, which obviously is not good if you're a man so and, or, and a woman. But also newer studies uh, have found that the insulin resistant aspect seems to be to do with olanzapine in, inducing phosphorylation. So remember I was saying before in the Randall cycle about when we stuff a load of fat and sugar into the cell, we get more phosphate. Well, here we go again, olanzapine making more phosphate and triggering inflammation. Then there's other theories about uh, macrophages uh, being upset by the olanzapine and mounting an inflammatory response again and encourages weight gain and then we've got a new study which again pointing at inflammation in metabolic organs so the the take-home message here is the absolute worst diet you can possibly give somebody on antipsychotics is a mixed macronutrient diet because you're just feeding a problem that's there already so again it's not just the it's not just these that are the problem it's what people are told to eat because when I did Georgia Eads course, we were talking a lot about can you put people on a ketogenic diet very soon after they've been prescribed these things to stop this weight gain? Because it's not just a couple of pounds. It can be a hundred pounds. Uh, and again, this this nonsense about um, it's balanced diets to be given to people who are unwell. It just infuriates me, especially with, with these kind of medication, because your weight, weight will just explode if you're given a carbohydrate and fat rich diet like, like happened to me 20 years ago. Right. So what, what's the pharmaceutical doctor's answer to weight gain? Well, back to this what, more medication, because there's a new thing out called um, Samidorphan, and this thing is now meant to um, stop the weight gain in bipolar and schizophrenia because it can bind to opioid receptors. Like there's a whole family of opioid receptors, and they are really interesting. We haven't got time to go in, but this particular fancy new drug is hypothesized to reduce cravings for high calorie food. So it's back to this thing and the serotonin hypothesis. Nobody actually knows. Uh, how do you know these people are not craving foods because somebody's feeding them mixed macronutrient diet? But anyway, this is kind of the story of, you know, let's just put more meds onto meds. And this is how people end up on five psychiatric medications and metformin and all sorts. So, again, the bottom line here is why are we giving these um, uh, medications to people that create inflammation and insulin resistance when insulin resistance and inflammation are the things causing brain problems in the first place? And again, sometimes people are given um, metformin. And then this little paper here talks about giving people to pyramate to um, prevent uh, this weight gain from antipsychotics. So to pyramate is another really interesting medication, which I did I have tried. And let's look at to pyramate. So there's a massive amount of prescriptions written for to pyramate, uh, much more in the States uh, than in the UK, because you can use it for seizures, migraines, impulsivity, bipolar disorder, obesity, binge eating, Tourette's, diabetic, peripheral neuropathy, alcohol addiction, fibromyalgia. So basically, uh, if this drug actually works, you could treat all of the hu main human conditions here. So whoever invented it is doing really well. And again, how many of these conditions can keto or carnivore help? Well, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of like anecdotal stories about people um, using uh, carnivore diets to overcome their particularly fibromyalgia. I think Bart himself um, was had, had chronic pain and that's what brought him to, to uh, carnivore. Um, di diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Well, there's a no brainer what really caused that. Then we've already talked about bipolar quite a lot. And then I talked about Denise and um, Beth and doing ketogenic diets for migraines and um, alcohol addiction and impulsivity. That's an interesting topic and binge eating as well. But again, changing the, what people are given to eat can change their desires to eat certain foods. So when it came to, um, to Pyramate, uh, first of all, it was discovered by accident because somebody was trying to make an anti-diabetes drug. So it didn't, wasn't even supposed to do all these seven or eight or nine things that you can get a prescription for it for. So whoever discovered it by accident is laughing their way to the bank. Um, the exact mechanism by Topiramate, how it works, isn't fully characterized. I'm just taking an excerpt out of a medical book of, on pharmacology. 
And then sapirumate is also a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. And it, and it said, the book said, well, the clinical significance is unknown. And carbonic anhydrase is basically vital for life because it changes carbon dioxide and water into bicarbonate and protons, which is kind of like a hugely important reaction in the body. And sapirumate inhibits that. And then also to pyramate works on um, sodium channels and all calcium channels. And Bart being like an exercise physiologist is going to be like, oh my gosh, this is not very good. It also works on GABA receptors and glutamate receptors. So we've got an addiction problem or potential here. So the problem with um, Topamax or to pyramate is it just binds to all uh, calcium channels and uh, sodium channels it doesn't mind which neuron it is it doesn't care so it's going to inhibit all neurons and synapses so it's going to affect heartbeats muscle contraction neurotransmitter release hormone release thinking lung function blinking regulating your own body uh, temperature so if the side effects like it's just insane we've got memory loss overheating pins and needles slow movements tiredness eye problems blindness bone problems and acidosis and it's problematic because it interacts with thousands of other drugs. But again, millions of people would rather take this than explore changing their diet. Maybe they don't even know about changing their diet. So basically, you've got the idea now about these psychiatric medications. Obviously, there's 120 more I could talk about, uh, and they all have the same caveats, the same side effects. So I've looked into them in massive detail about what do they actually do, or they did, are they even doing what they're supposed to do? So when it comes to who wins in the danger competition the meds or the or the diets it's just hands down the meds and no matter even if, if somebody at home decided oh, i know i want to do a four to one ketogenic diet without the help of a dietitian it's still safer than just oh i think i might take uh, some of these medications so again this nonsense about ketogenic diets people going around telling you that they're dangerous um, are just talking complete rubbish. And again, of course, the carnivore gets even more flack because it sounds like it's even more bizarre than the ketogenic diet. So it's just this utter nonsense that people are talking without assessing proper danger. The people shouting, oh, carnivore and keto are dangerous, are probably chomping away on an SSRI as they're writing their comments. So basically, that's why I eat the way I do, because I don't want to take those things. And at this very moment in time, I'm doing a two to one um, ketogenic, modified ketogenic diet. I learned it from, from Beth uh, and Denise. So I measure my ketones and glucose every day because we're collecting a load of data because we've got like things we want to like study. We've got things we want to make pilot data for, you know, all kinds of stuff. So we're kind of collecting data. So this is back to this thing, like some days my ketones are things like three or even six. I've got, this is not a CGM. This is just me measuring my blood sugar. And sometimes I eat and then forget and then measure blood sugar. So it's like ridiculous. This is um, a few, yes, yeah, the beginning of August. So we've got high ketones and low, low blood sugar. So, so that's all fine for making lots of ketones. But I have discovered that I personally don't need the ketones like that. And then there are times I have to go back to what I was doing before, which was which was carnivore, which is cutting down on the fat and upping, upping the protein. And I'll explain a little bit why. So again, back to ketogenic diets. This is the advantage the carnivore's got, that when you do keto, you're going to get tempted into all this nonsense. Whereas if you go carnivore, well, it's not there. I have seen carnivore crisps and stuff like that. And I, like Dr. Ryan Attar, I, I don't approve of the snacks and things. But again, for some of my clients and some people, they're not going to do it unless they can have a snack. But the keto shit is just dreadful. It's We've tested ketones and blood sugar and weight loss a lot with these, and they just basically fuck shit up. So I would just stay away from them. So like I said, I'm not 100% carnivore because I do sometimes uh, deviate because with people I work with, they sometimes just can't do it and sometimes for social reasons. So I've found that cucumbers uh, um, are not offensive. A cucumber is actually not even a vegetable. It's a fruit because it's related to watermelons. And then celery... Um, that's non-offensive. Sauerkraut and pickles I use because sometimes I'll just do a day of just sauerkraut and pickles and some mackerel. It's sort of my own like strange uh, detox thing. Then herbs and spices and garlic, but I try to limit them just because when your food's too flavoursome, you're just more likely to overeat it. Then mushrooms of all varieties because they're not even a plant. Um, I, I stopped eating dark chocolate when I went carnivore because I did have a bit of a problem with it and I, it's kind of cured that problem. 
then berries which I pick in the summer season only and because uh, even though berries are allowed on keto that they're one of the most sprayed on vegetables to do with pesticides and I think raisins and grapes are even worse but again uh, you know pesticides uh, use on vegetables even if you don't even if you're okay with um, the plants natural defenses we've we've humans have put things all over their vegetables then I make kefir by hardly ever I use it rarely maybe once what once a week or even once a month or I remember just because it's easy and then brie once a week for the k2 and when I buy meat I'm quite keen on buying meat on the bone because I think this idea of picking meat off the bone with your teeth is really important uh, for our dental health just mush all the time is not good so I am uh, into like bones uh, and that that's the cheaper meat because people are lazy and think oh I can't be asked with that I just want a steak or mint which is easier but this idea of picking meat off the bone like our ancestors did I've found it's you know really helped to help my teeth I, I me, my family and I we grow apples uh, we, uh, we have done for a long time and my, my dad's more into it than me I've got my own trees and I don't I give my apples away or I'll eat them occasionally in season but because we've studied all apple breeds it's all about this notion that the apples you see today are not the apples of the original apple, like something horrible, like the crab apple. That's the original British apple. And it's a really small, horrible, bitter, sour thing that's got hardly any sugar in it. And over the years, we've created all these crazy plants. And, and the most crazy of the apples, I think, is the pink lady, because the amount of sugar in that is just absolutely insane. And the apple's massive as well. So uh, one pink lady, if you're doing a ketogenic diet, you can probably have like a, a, like a a slice of it maybe then um, for minerals as I was saying before running around with blood sugar of 3.9 millimolar all the time and um, even six after food and a, a low protein diet um, yes that's great in some way but uh, as, as some people know or may not know insulin is not an evil monstrous thing it does all sorts in the body and it's really important for helping the kidneys to keep minerals in so when I was doing things wrong, I did have a low insulin problem and I was thirsty all the time and I was weighing out my own minerals. But it's my own fault because what, what was I expecting if there was never any insulin um, release? So, so you don't need a great big spike, just a hump. And then, first of all, stopping caffeine, because that's going to encourage minerals to get pissed out even more. Changing meal sizes and timing and changing macros, that solved the problem. But also, not getting too technical about it, there's stuff to do with called structured water, which people who are proponents of fruit and vegetables will say, well, the structured water, um, you're less likely to get dehydrated. Yes, I agree. I, I know what easy water is, but you can make your own by putting water out in glass in the sun or shining uh, infrared light on it. And for whatever reason, I'm not mass I'm not going to go into quantum physics now. That kind of water tends to be more hydrating. But I did try that and still, no matter what, I need an insulin uh, release to keep the minerals in. But there's water and then there's water is what I'm trying to say, which is back to what I said right at the beginning. There is more to mental health and health than just food. Um, then I use uh, magnesium supplements and some other mixed minerals sometimes just because of like it's common knowledge the soil is bad quality and uh, it, magnesium can be harder to, to get on a... Um, a, a carnivore and keto diet but at the end of the day magnesium is hard to get on any diet these days and I used to have liver often and now I just have it once or twice a week maybe once once a week just because if you count up how much vitamin A and copper there is you can build up uh, the vitamin A is more worrying because the half-life something like a year some crazy uh, length with a copper because there's lots of zinc in a meat-based diet the chances of a copper overload if you eat enough zinc from meat possibly but again liver is pretty copper dense so um, if, if you eat liver a lot um, it's worth having a test so it's not bad or anything like that it's just I was told oh you must eat it all the time and then I've learned actually maybe I shouldn't I'll have it um, less. And then there's this uric acid because liver can raise uric acid. So we'll come to that shortly. Then this other thing, which um, this came up on Bart's channel uh, a while back about Thomas DeLore talking about saturated fat being bad. It's like, yeah, we know. Well, everything in excess is bad and it's all about balance. And this is just a quote from um, 
a, a registered dietitian about how our own body fat is, is half saturated fat and half olive oil, if you will. And when we look at some fats in a moment, you're going to see that, well, actually, so is beef. There's loads of fats that are the mixed. So it's this thing, this idea that, yes, of course, eating stupid amounts of anything, any kind of fat is going to be bad for you. Uh, and yes, I completely agree. Seed oils are absolutely terrible. And there are unsaturated fats in fish, in eggs, in, in meat, as you'll see in a moment. So we had a quick like breakdown of different kinds of fats because people get very upset about um, the, the saturated fat in meat. But if you have a look, first of all, at something like goose fat or chicken fat, there's hardly any. Well, it's not very much saturated fat anyway. People jump up and down about chicken and the puffers and the polyunsaturated fat. That's, again, completely up to you because it, it, for some people, they think, well, I've restricted everything in my life. I just love chicken. I'm still going to eat it. That's completely up to you. And then in defense of chicken, like the thighs have got like massive amounts of K2 in it. And some people will say, well, what's worse, dairy or chicken thighs? And, and K2 is really important. So for every negative, there's always a positive. When we look at beef fat and tallow, as you'll see for yourself, it's like 50-50. So nature already designed the fat to match our fat. So it's not 100% saturated fat. When we start to now look into the into like a plant fat, maybe cocoa butter, which is a really interesting fat to start with, that's like 60% saturated, but it's super low in polyunsaturated. And that's mainly stearic acid. And then some people will argue about that too much stearic acid is bad. But then when would humans have ever been able to consume vast lumps of sort of pure fat, which then leads me into the MCT oil, which is 100 percent saturated fat. And every, not everybody, but people of all walks of life and diet, keto or non keto, all really like MCT oil. And not once have I ever seen people screaming about, oh, it's going to kill you and give you a heart attack. They seem to gobble it up happily. And it's, it is 100 percent saturated fat. And also these uh, MCT oils and ketone salts are all brand new. Our ancestors didn't have these. Our ancestors had coconut oil and that's high in, in, in um, it's quite high in uh, MCT oil, but it's not like pure MCT oil. So again, it's just be realistic people when you start getting upset about things and the the animal fat is, 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 not, is not the enemy. And it's been designed almost like perfectly engineered for, to match our fat. And then the other thing that people ask about is what about fruit? Well, as I said earlier, um, it, the fruit today is not the fruit, the traditional breeds of things. They've been bred for high sugar and tastiness, which um, for some people like me is not going to work because it's going to activate the Randall cycle. It's going to um, disturb my ratios. So people who binge eat um, uh, apples and bananas and uh, grapes can set them off. And I do have clients that do that and they just can't have it because it'll just set off a binge. Uh, then the liver can only process 15 grams of fructose a day. So that's probably telling you that we shouldn't be stuffing it down our necks. Um, fructose can be really naughty because it can blind leptin and leptin is our um, it manages appetite and regulates our metabolism. And if fructose is interfering with that, it just gives us a free run to just eat and eat and eat and eat uh, because there's no restriction on it. Uh, large amounts of fructose also drive fatty liver, which then drive insulin resistance. That's a that's a whole webinar all of its own. And then fructose also raises uric acid and it contains deuterium, which I'll touch on these two now. So because we're kind of running out of time, human beings don't have a functional uricase gene. And that's the um, would make a protein that basically breaks down uric acid. And this is this happened for an evolutionarily very important reason is that we wouldn't have survived if we did have a uricase gene because we make three times more uric acid than other mammals, which means we can get really fat really quickly. So and we can get insulin resistant really quickly as well. So that's why, you know, um, fructose again was has been conveniently designed. So our ancestors could gobble up fruit, make make a load of extra uric acid and get fat so that we could survive the winter. So like everything, uric acid has its evolutionary purpose. But unfortunately, nowadays, these genes are fat genes. There's loads of them um, are all living in an extremely obesogenic uh, environment because there's just food everywhere being shoved at us. And 
you couldn't see the consequences. So that was very briefly what uric acid and uricase is all about and why as, as human beings, we do have this higher reading than, than others. But when we dig, dig into uric acid, that doctors and things will tell you, oh yes, uric acid causes gout and kidney stones. It's actually a different kind of kidney stone to the oxalate one, but it's related. And then the, the things to blame are shellfish, meat and alcohol. And then before we get upset about the meat and the purines, some vegetables like asparagus and broccoli have got lots of purines. Um, deeper studies have shown that being insulin resistant is a much bigger um, risk or um, trait for gout. And then when you come into getting lab tests properly for gout, if you just look at uric acid, it's not going to tell you very much because fasting, fructose, exercise, ketones, to pyramate, losing weight, salt, alcohol, obesity genes are all going to raise uric acid as well. So you've got to look more deeply and look at it uh, in the context of how did the uric acid get high? Because uric acid is also an antioxidant, so it's got this other purpose. So when people are being tested for gout, I've got a uric acid measurer and I've got like probably 60 readings now uh, to, to in my little study and uric acid readings alone are absolutely useless because you need serum ferritin you need fasting insulin so we're reporting on insulin resistance and inflammation you need blood cell width uh, oxalate level because like i said oxalates and uric acid together cause problems so just having a high uric acid alone is no use because somebody might be in the middle of a fast, they might be doing a ketogenic diet, they might have exercised a lot the day before, or they might not have just drunk enough water that day. So you can't say, oh, that person's got high uric acid, they're going to have gout because you need to look at everything. And you also look at the person's lifestyle to see how did the uric acid get raised in the first place, because it's going to be like the cholesterol conundrum that the uric acid is being blamed uh, when all it's doing is its job. And again, like I said, it's an antioxidant, so it's got protective qualities. Right. Last thing, because I did notice in one of the, the comments on um, the Instagram was about deuterium. So Bart's got lots of his own videos on, on deuterium anyway, which are going to probably get re-uploaded. So when, when we talk about deuterium, what we mean is we mean heavy water. It's like an isotope. It's nothing evil. It's just um, elements exist in different forms. And in the mitochondria, the um, as you can see here, the the water gets split and the hydrogens get pushed um, into the intermembrane space so that they can travel down the F1 ATPase and we're basically going to make um, some ATP. But also the deuteriums, I've put some D pluses up there, the heavy water, the, the, the bigger hydrogens can get pushed up there as well. So we've got ordinary hydrogens like small people sliding down a slide and then we've got big people sliding down or trying to slide down. So what what happens is the big ones um because they're bigger just make the ftp uh, a's or the ft the f1 ftpa synthase i should have said in the mitochondria it makes it spin slower so when that happens it's going to spin slower and produce less atp and as i've mentioned several times in this talk we should have got the idea now that when we have less atp we're going to have more adp and phosphate and then as the amount of ATP decreases, the amount of phosphate uh, builds up. So again, as I've mentioned already several times, this buildup of phosphate, we saw it in the Randall cycle, we saw it with the olanzapine and the inflammation. This again, this deuterium uh, is going to cause or trigger or start off the first step of inflammation because this phosphate can activate inflammatory cytokines and start the inflammation process. So, so why have I spent ages talking about deuterium? Well, a really good way to get lots of deuterium is from, from fruit. And I'm not an expert in fruit in and out of season, but apparently when it's out of season, it's even more deuterium rich. So back to um, what we were talking about, the mitochondrial dysfunction and the bipolar study. Um, should they be eating loads of fruit if we're kind of doing this to our mitochondria? Should people who've got mitochondrial problems already be eating more deuterium? Uh, should people who are eating a mixed macronutrient diet, raising their phosphate, messing up their ATP, who've also taking antipsychotics, messing up their mitochondria, should they be eating loads of fruit? What do you think? 
So that's the end of our um, little uh, talk about mental health and biochemistry. Absolutely outstanding from start to finish, as I knew, of course, that it would be, Dr. Sarah Pugh. Brilliant stuff. I think you've hit every nail squarely flush on its head. Yeah. And what would be really good is if people would take this video and share it widely so that people get exposed to this information, to this material, and understand what is being said here. Questions, what I'm going to ask you to do, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and attack helicopters, of course, is to put your questions in writing and put those questions underneath this video in the pre-recorded video section, not here right now in the live premiere presentation chat, uh, but put it as a question under the video once it becomes a pre-recorded video, no longer a live chat video. And then what we'll do is we'll search through those questions in a week or so, pick out the best ones and do a video answering those questions. Plus or minus Sarah, if she's available. Um, I hope very much that she is because it's always a privilege and a pleasure to have you, Sarah, on the channel. Um, to that end, where do people find you? How do they get hold of you? What are your links and things? Um, I, I'm, I go by Busy Superhuman. I'm uh, quite big on TikTok. I, um, I've got like about 60,000 followers because it's um, I'm just working. Right. Brilliant. Okay. It says, Sarah Pugh's computer stopped their recording. Hmm. Okay. Sarah's gone. Right. Anyway, it was very, very good to have you, Sarah Pugh, on the channel. Dr. Sarah Pugh, appreciate your time very, very much. And um, for the rest of you, you know the drill, don't let the door hit you in the backside on the way out. Don't forget to put your questions underneath this video in writing. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe to Sarah's channels. Um, yeah, don't yeah, forget just, just, to... Just kick out then. Yes, rudeness, wasn't it? Yeah. You're back. <laughs> Welcome back. Okay, so yes. there, you get, there you have it. Basically, in a nutshell, um, we've done the summarizing. Uh, all that remains is to, once again, thank you, Dr. Sarah Pugh, very, very much for your time. And we will see you possibly in a couple of weeks for question and answer session. We'll probably do that live. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, the thing is, I'm more, I, I've been wanting to come on. This talk has been on the cards for ages, and I wanted it to be good, and I needed to cover lots of things which you've already covered so we can put it all together and i had to bring in some science as well but yeah i'm always here for you bart it's just um it was obviously terrible when your channel went down but i'm i'm gonna be here more for you because there's just no way i'm having like that happen again so and we just have to just get rid of the the the, the nonsense and you know get this out to as many people as possible so Brilliant. yeah Brilliant. All right, we'll close off there. Thank you very much. And, um, yep, we'll see the rest of you for the next video. Uh, we're in probably someone on the interwebs will be wrong about something. It'll probably be Paul Saladino again. See you then. Okay.